All right, welcome everyone. And uh, this is the second session, which is a talk on uh, why study engineering and a general overview and also some uh, frequently asked questions that's burning in your head. So uh, I'm Associate Professor Dr. Ng Johan, who is also the Head of Academic Quality and Innovation for the campus. And um, I'll run through 30 minutes of presentation and then uh, I'll take the last half an hour some questions that you might have. Okay, so... Um, so for the next half an hour, together with me, we'll be unraveling the mysteries of the wonderful world of engineering. And um, a bit on the background or you know, the history of engineering is that, um, so if we go through the history of engineering, then um, engineering can be divided into four major areas of development. Um, number one would be the pre-scientific revolution, followed by the industrial revolution, followed by the second industrial revolution, and then uh, the information age. So I'm sure all of you could name some of the pre-scientific revolution uh, structures, the famous ones, such as the pyramids in Egypt, and then the Paternon and the Acropolis in Greece, and also uh, maybe the Colosseum and uh, Circus Maximus in Rome. Okay, then uh, above all, I believe that the aqueducts would probably rank even higher among all the um, famous ones. Okay, then uh, of course uh, that lasted for a couple thousand years. And then um, close to a um, couple hundred years ago, then we had the first industrial revolution, which was uh, sparked by the steam engine. So of course, uh, modern day, we might look at the modern steam engine as um, you know, one of many engines available, but um, really that was the one that uh, sparked the first industrial revolution, where we start to replace human muscle with engines. Okay, so previously, prior to that, you know, we have um, oxes, um, horses, and humans carrying all the things. So how did they build the pyramid and so on? They built purely using uh, muscle and so on, right? Then after that, uh, after the first industrial revolution, which was sparked by the steam engine, then uh, we went on to the second industrial revolution. And that's where uh, the, main, the two main engineering initially, which is civil and mechanical engineering, and then they um, spread it out to a larger base which includes things like uh, chemical engineering. So chemical engineering was, uh, of course, sparked by some um, very famous reaction, which you might even learn in school, such as the Haber process. So Haber process is uh, quite remarkable in the sense that it is one of the only few processes which, um, you know, from the beginning until today, hasn't changed much. So of course, the Haber process also stopped um, the crisis of their time, which is uh, food scarcity. Okay, then you have uh, electrical engineer, of course, I know um, the reason that you and me are even sitting over here today is that um, because there is electrical engineers uh, making that happen. And of course, uh, you know, you have telecommunication, airplanes, mass production as some of the other outcomes that came out from the second industrial revolution. Then after that, you know, we also have now the information age and uh, this has produced tremendous changes. And if you notice, each of the revolution got shorter and shorter and you know, uh, the world is moving much quicker now. So in the past decade or so, or in the past couple of decades or so, um, there were huge changes in uh, telecommunication, microelectronics. I mean, if you ask somebody uh, of my age on, you know, um, could you put a phone like this you know, into your pocket? Uh, I'm sure that you know, 20 years ago, we would say no, because um, phones are really large. You know, you can place it in a, huge area in your car, you know, and so on. So if you look at this brief history over here, which uh, started from um, 1600 uh, BC all the way to 200 BC, a 1400 um, year stretch, okay? So what you find is that um, there is the wheel and pulley, the hanging gardens, the statue of Zeus, the battering ram, the trebuchet, and so on. So what happened in all this scenario is that um, what you do see is that if you look back in the past um, two millennium, two millennium, then uh, what you do get is that there's only mechanical and civil related um, inventions or you know landmarks over here, because uh, again in the good old days, the mechanical engineers would produce the weapons to attack the civil engineer targets. So there has always been the um, you know trigger point of um why do we have engineering and of course uh, in peacetime nowadays uh, we have uh, you know, chemical engineering electric engineering all moving forward because of that 
So um, let's look at some milestones which are change the world. So obviously the wheel, which is said to be the most important invention, uh, was invented around uh, 3500 BC. Of course, um, the wheel without pulley, which only came about um, 1900 years later. Okay, yeah. So a wheel without pulley would just be a wheel only. Then of course, uh, the compass, one of the four big uh, invention in China, okay, or the big uh, ancient invention in China. So it was uh, invented around 1050 BC. Of course, you also have the, um, another good one, which is the automobile. So this is in 1886 by German inventor Karl Benz. So um, a bit of trivia is that, um, of course, the modern day Mercedes Benz came from um, two different companies. Um, you know, when they merged, which is uh, Daimler and Benz. Then of course, uh, there's an interesting story about uh, Daimler and Benz is that uh, one of the employee inside uh, Daimler, so he has a daughter. So the daughter is uh, called Mercedes. So he named his daughter, I mean, the car after his daughter Mercedes. And that's why you get um, Mercedes Benz today. Okay. Then of course, um, you know, I think every single um, kid nowadays, they know this uh, very famous cartoon or even during my time. And it's called Thomas the Train. So of course, most of you will not be familiar uh, no, on why Thomas the Train is called Thomas the Train. Um, you know, I'm pretty sure it's because of um, Thomas Savery who is the inventor of steam engine in 1698. So um, because of um, Thomas Savery, we have the steam engine, which sparked one of the industrial revolution. Then also you have the petrol. Petrol uh, was found by Edwin Drake in 1859, which is uh, when the first oil well um, you know, shoots up from the ground and then they refine it further many years later to produce the kerosene. Um, there's one notable omission over here is definitely the diesel uh, engine. So diesel engine is interesting in the sense that um, diesel is the only item in the whole of engineering where it's, um, you know, four things are named after diesel, Rudolf Diesel that is. So the inventor of the diesel engine is um, Rudolf Diesel. And then the fuel that powers the engine is also called diesel. The engine that, pow that is the engine itself is also called diesel. And then the thermodynamic cycle, which you learn in engineering, which powers the diesel engine is also called diesel. So this, um, very interesting occurrence of um, all things called diesel. So if you learn engineering, you'll find that this is a very interesting uh, coincidence. Yeah. Then of course you have uh, the next thing, which is um, aviation. So uh, the Wright brothers, um, very famously, had their first um, powered and also sustained air flight in 1903, which today is uh, about 117 years ago. Okay. Then of course uh, you have the light bulb and um, Edison and so on, uh, after with a lot of uh, dispute, you know, um, they produced it independently in 1879 and uh, 1880. Of course, also you have uh, James Harrison to thank for because of the fridge that he built, the first mechanical fridge. So when you see the word uh, vapor compression system, it's not exactly the modern day uh, fridge that we have now. It's a very mechanical base. So, um, you know, there is a lot of um, bits and pieces that still exist until today, like the um, four item in the cycle and so on. But uh, then again, things has evolved greatly since 19 years ago. So electricity, obviously this is linked to Michael Faraday, who discovered the principles of electricity generation. And then uh, you also have the Bessemer process, which helped the mass production of steel in a very, very cheap manner. So without the Bessemer process, uh, I highly doubt that we would hit um, that much um, steel usage and so on. Then of course, um, television, I'm seeing the name over here, Paul Gottlieb Nico. So um, usually the television is um, accredited to, or rather, you know, is um, linked to another inventor. Um, I recall it would be John Logie Bart. Okay. So, uh, but in this case, um, Paul, who is a German student at that point, so he created the television when he was just age 23, which means that um, if you're entering foundation now, you'd be aged uh, 17 to 18. So that means uh, in five years from now, after you complete your engineering studies, maybe the next big invention would come from you. Okay, so um, with regards to engineering again, uh, what do engineers face or what are the future challenges uh, facing engineers in this case? Um, you know, in, the, in 2008, which is about a dozen years ago, 
then the National Academy of Engineering in the USA created the list of engineering goals for the 21st century, which is um, today. So there are 14 grand challenges, which is to improve sustainability, which is a huge thing. You know, you have definitely heard of the United Nations Sustainability Development Goal, also the uh, health issues, okay, of course, uh, with the pandemic now, you know, um, health is even more important, security, and most importantly, the joy of, the joy of um, living on global scale. So prior to the 21st century, um, most nations only gauge themselves with regards to uh, more economic measures such as uh, gross domestic product and so on. But nowadays, if you look at um, how countries measure themselves, you would see something new called the GNH, so Gross National Happiness. So countries have started to look at um, how happy they are rather than how rich they are. Okay. So if you look at the list of um, all 14 grand challenges over here, then um, obviously there will be you know, items that at once personalized learning. And uh, I must say that Southampton Malaysia is uh, doing that rather well in terms of our advanced personalized learning. So we do cater a lot of um, personal learning, personal attention to all of our students. Okay. Then um, there's a second one, which is uh, solar energy. So solar energy will soon dispose um, or rather depose uh, most other um, green energy form and once it becomes uh, more economical. And then of course, uh, the fourth one is quite interesting, reverse engineering the brain. So um, this has already been done through a technique, uh, you know, if I were to simplify it, called the artificial neural network. So your brains run on a neural network. So what happens is that, um, you know, scientists through some coding and so on, or engineers through some codings uh, in a program called MATLAB or even Python, we can also create a artificial brain to look at things you know, in a black box manner. And um, engineers also create better medicines while doctors administer those medicines. Doctors do not create medicines. Okay, so engineers alongside the pharmacies and the you know, biomedical scientists and so on, they would work in a group to create medicine, to create medical devices. Yep. Then of course, uh, you have at once health informatics. So um, health informatics is an interesting field. So if any of you have the um, Apple Watch uh, Series 5, then uh, surely on a daily basis, 24-7, you'll be submitting your health information to the watch, to the Apple server, and you know, they would um, re-evaluate those um, ECG graphs and so on and see that you know, if you're in any danger of um, you know, having a uh, heart risk and so on. Right. Then of course, uh, access to clean water. So clean water and also energy is the you know, main problems of our time. And unlike energy, energy can be transported. Energy is not a local problem. Energy is a global problem. On the other hand, clean water is purely a local problem. Once you solve a clean water problem in, say, a country, you cannot transport that kind of um, you know, technology and the, wat uh, the water itself to another country. It's always very localized. Um, you can also provide energy from fusion and so on. So again, you know, I wouldn't go through all the 14 grand challenges, but there's a lot of grand challenges uh, waiting for engineers to solve. And these are the problems that um, we all as a you know, humankind would face. So if you want to pursue engineering as a course of study, then um, you know, it's important to understand that engineering is a kaleidoscope of disciplines where you know, the field of engineering from the initial two, which is um, mechanical and civil, now he has expanded to really, really a huge and diverse field of study and application. So up to date, um, there are over 40 commonly recognized specialization. I will show you the list over here now. And uh, if you look over at the, uh, this list, you can see uh, very common ones like um, aerospace engineering, if you want to be an aerospace engineer, civil engineering, energy engineering for sustainability, computer engineering, architecture, agriculture, automotive, and so on. Okay, there's a lot of those. And then um, the good thing is that Santa is offering most of these um, disciplines either through a program on its own or through specialization. So um, there's at least um, 25 to 26 specialization to choose from, from our three main uh, undergraduate courses, of which, of course, are if you can start from foundation, then you go to undergraduate, and then you can go on to the specialization. All right, so 
what do I study to become an engineer? So you must be thinking of the pathway. Um, I'm just going a bit more general. So at pre-university level, um, of course, you can go through uh, some level of certification. But of course, this would be vocational qualification and it covers the fundamental concepts and also basics. So, um, you know, I guess the certificate would not qualify you as a full-fledged engineer, but instead maybe as a um, junior technician and so on. Of course, you have to be a technician then, uh, or you know, even a junior engineer at first, then um, obviously you can go through the diploma process. And of course, uh, it's very vocational based and it covers a bit more uh, intermediate theoretical and uh, practical syllabus. On the other hand, uh, you can not, I mean, you can choose not to go into vocational and instead um, take foundation and we do offer foundation. So what is foundation studies in general? It is a specialized preparatory program for those transitioning into an undergraduate pro uh, degree. So just bear in mind that it's a, a non-vocational qualification. So non-vocational means that uh, you, know, you do study in a way that uh, is not fully hands-on based or it's not fully you know, guiding you towards to become a technician. So it brings you future, I mean, it brings you towards becoming a full-fledged engineer. Okay? So once you complete your foundation, then uh, the next logical step would be to go to the undergraduate. Of course, our undergraduate would also have um, different flavors. So one of those would be bachelors of engineering, of which uh, are just quite short for BEng. So it can be a three to four year uh, duration. And uh, why is it three to four years? Because um, three years would be for those in the UK and four years would be for those um, anywhere else. So the UK um, syllabus is a lot quicker, a lot more compact. You know, um, that's a good thing because uh, you get to go to work a bit earlier and of course, you know, um, earn the money and so on. So the, even completing the BN allows you pathway towards the chartered engineer status and uh, it gives you an entry point into a career in engineering and outstanding graduates can also opt to pursue postgraduate opportunities. So myself, um, okay, um, I completed my bachelor's of engineering after three years in a UK-based system. And then from there, what I did was uh, I did a fast track PhD and then um, you know, completed my PhD in another three to four years. So this is also the pathway that um, my current PhD student is adopting. Okay. Alternatively, you can also do a integrated uh, Masters of Engineering, and for short, I'll just call it MEng. Okay, so this is a four-year duration um, program, and this is only common for UK-based um, engineering degrees. So it gives you a direct pathway towards chartered engineer status, and then graduates can opt to pursue doctoral or PhD opportunities too. After that, okay. so when it comes to postgraduate studies, then uh, you can either do the uh, MRES or MPhil, Masters of Research or Masters of Philosophy. And this is all the um, Masters flavored programs. They can last from one to two years in general. Um, it can be thought based, it can be research based, or it can be mixed mode. So it provides you a path for career advancement and a point of entry into an academic career. So just bear in mind that um, Masters now, I mean, Masters degree nowadays um, should certainly be considered as um, one of the minimum that you want to hit uh, for your future career pathway. Okay, because um, you know, people get more educated as a society every uh, generation or so. Of course, you can also pursue your PhD, which is a Doctor of Philosophy, over a three-year period if you're doing it full-time, or even an eight-year period if you are doing it um, part-time. So, right. Then um, for PhDs, it can be purely research doctoral degree or also contain coursework. Okay, but uh, the coursework component will be very, very minor and usually done as a aside to your main um, research work. It can strengthen your academic career in the future and also provide a pathway to consultancy roles and so on. So I'm a lecturer at the uh, University of Southampton, Malaysia. At the same time, I do uh, do a bit of consultancy in the industry. So you must be thinking, what would be the entry requirements for undergraduate degrees in engineering? So of course, um, each undergraduate engineering degree uh, differs according to university. And of course, the better ranked university would have um, 
slightly higher uh, entry requirement and that's a good thing because uh, you don't want uh, you know anybody to be the engineer okay you want uh, really good students and elite students to be engineers to serve the field later on so this means that engineering is a competitive field and um, getting in is not always that easy so first and foremost um, english proficiency is a must and in this scenario um, okay so one of the points would be um, IELTS so you need to have a equivalent of um, 6.5 in IELTS or even a C in as first language in English okay. then uh, you need to take prerequisite subjects like mathematics physics um, additional mathematics if that's available in your um, study systems and also some science subjects like chemistry and biology then uh, in terms of grades um, you know in a good university you need to hit uh, for international baccalaureate you need to hit um, 36 point overall and also say for a levels uh, it'll be things like triple a for mathematics physics and uh, one other science subject ideally then of course uh, you can't count general studies and critical thinking as one of the a's over here then uh, let's say if you come from india then you can use your cbse and get a 82 mark overall with um, 85 percent in uh, mathematics and physics So what does it take to be an engineer? Um, I'll just go through this is that uh, you must have strong analytical skill or must be willing to acquire this skill over here. So this um, nice little look to be an engineer refers to the skills that uh, you should already have or want to possess after three to four years of uh, studying engineering. And uh, you must have some form of um, practical ingenuity. Okay? So you must be a practical person. You must be creative at the same time because um, you know, um, creativity is really about you know, producing a non-conventional answers to solve a uh, problem uh, you must be able to communicate in a team as a person and in person and also through uh, verbal through written through you know, various different forms of communication which is also emerging um, as we develop more forms of communication and then um, there's a lot of uh, misconception to think that you know uh, when it comes to engineering you would only be focusing on the technical aspect uh, the modern engineer no longer focuses on the technical aspect only in fact uh, you know the business um, acumen the management skills are really important then of course uh, you know when you think about engineers what do they do they create solution so when you create something you're actually first in the world to do something which means that you're leading the entire uh, industry to create something so this means that you, know, um, you must have some form of leadership, you know, um, your personal leadership, your work leadership, you know, your technical leadership. You know, there's a lot of different forms of leadership they need to do. And because you're creating solutions which is um, so impactful to the society, then uh, obviously you need to be highly ethical and adhering to professional standards. So engineering is one of the few professional professions. Okay? So it's important to be a professional. And of course, uh, you must be dynamic, you must be agile, you must be resilient, and all these are 21st century skills. And then above all, you must have uh, the willingness to um, go for lifelong learning. So these are some of the skills, you know, the attributes, the characteristics and skills required to be an engineer. Okay. So what are the steps to achieve your engineering dreams? Um, I just simplify it to three steps over here. Number one really is to find out if engineering is even for you. Okay, step number one. So step number one, uh, you know, if I break down into sub-steps, very simple, just list down your favorite subjects that you're good at. If you see that your favorite subjects are things like um, mathematics, physics, chemistry, or even English, then you're already one, you know, one leg into engineering. And then of course, look at your favorite subjects, look at the subjects that you already do at the moment and see if they are part of the requirements for the engineering program of your choice. If you're still unsure at this point, then by all means, go to a career center, you know, take a career personality test or sign up for career counseling session or even better, contact our academics here at the University of Southampton, Malaysia and you know, speak to us and I guess um, we'll be more than 
happy to guide you through some of the um, career-related questions or counseling. So do make use of our virtual information desk. Okay. Um, then you can go to step number two once you ascertain that engineering is for you. You can research your options. So it is very frequently, I mean, known that you know, um, you know, most students know that they want to do engineering, but then again, they would ask themselves, which engineering to do? Okay. Should I do mechanical? Should I do electrical? Should I do aero? What should I do? So I would recommend is um, simply shortlist your engineering choices. Okay, just shortlist those courses that interest you. Research on the top universities that are offer them. Okay, do emphasize on the word top universities, and then you know, compare your uh, financial situation. Look at the tuition fees, your career opportunities in the future. Then uh, of course you know, top universities often lead to um, better career opportunities, and you know, they're always correlated. Then once you have um, decide on your top three choices quickly so that you, know, you can just uh, streamline your thoughts. So once you uh, decide on your top three choices, you can move on to step number three, which is to secure your spot. And uh, in this case, you know, uh, as you secure your spot, try to also identify scholarship opportunities. I uh, have all of your documents ready. So you must be thinking, what are those documents? Um, the documents can be things like your CV, your personal statements, and so on, okay? Then uh, start applying, you know, spend all your downtime, you know, away from school applying to scholarships and you know, grab your spot with um, all the top universities. So, of course, you know, you can go to the counseling session later on, uh, the online counseling session, and see if you could seek help from our counselors and maybe start your application process. Uh, be sure to stick to deadlines. There's always two good reasons to stick to deadline. First is so that you don't get disqualified. Second is uh, there's always early bird uh, deadlines and everything, which again, save you costs over the long term. So um, just do your best on this part, secure your spot, and before long, you'll be an engineer. Okay, so these are some of the programs offered at uh, the University of Southampton, Malaysia. And those include um, three undergraduate programs. That is our ever popular mechanical engineering program. Okay, and the um, higher flying, Aeronautics and Astronautics Engineering, okay, and then very power-packed um, electrical and electronic engineering. And of course, um, for you to enter these three programs, uh, one of the good way as the method to funnel in will be through the Engineering Foundation year. So if you have set your mind in engineering, I would recommend go to the Foundation year straight away so that you don't have to, you know, I mean, you can focus yourself or devote yourself into engineering a year ahead of everybody, okay? Uh, that would pay off handsomely over a longer term. So I'll just run through a list of um, five frequently asked questions. Um, so in this scenario, okay, would, would I get a, will I get a Bachelor's of Engineering or a Master's of Engineering? So at the moment, uh, in our campus, all of our engineering um, undergraduate degree programs are currently you know, nominally stated for four years, okay, and they are Master's of Engineering based. But of course, um, if you meet the requirement and you want to graduate after three years, uh, feel free to graduate with a Bachelor's of Engineering. So uh, it's really your choice if you want to do three to four years, but you would always be registered um, under MH first. So this gives you a lot of option and I really love this option. Okay, then uh, the next question, another uh, frequently asked question is that, can I do my Master's of Engineering fully in Malaysia? So all of our Masters of Engineering program are on a split campus, which is what we call a two plus two basis. So two years in Malaysia and two years in the UK. And I must emphasize that this is not a twinning program. Again, I emphasize this is not a twinning program. So twinning program is from one, you know, one university, which they franchise to another university. On the other hand, our programs over here are thoroughbred, you know, true and true Southampton University's uh, program. So we are not another university, we are just um, the same university. So this is a split campus, two plus two basis. So this model is really necessary because of our cost structure and we believe that it provides invaluable exposure and um, also you know, for future global opportunities via the UK education pathways. And uh, our graduates are, are testament to this and they said that this is really, really a good um, thing to have. Okay. So what if I don't meet the entry requirement? Um, 
in this scenario, let's say if you're at the borderline results cases, then uh, I'm sure that you know, we can look at your case on a case-by-case -case basis. And then uh, the uh, admissions team, the senior admission tutor, and whoever is involved should be able to review and look at uh, if we could accept your scenario uh, on a case-by-case -case basis. So my recommendation is that um, you know, whether or not you meet the requirement or you have borderline results, um, do speak to our counsellors, do apply, and then we'll review from there, okay? Don't deny yourself a chance. And uh, what scholarships do we offer? Uh, we offer high achiever scholarships up to 100%. They are all merit-based. There's no applications required when it's merit-based, okay? So we make it really simple. We really, really want to educate the best students, okay? Then uh, we also have uh, transition bursaries when you head over to the UK. And uh, that's 20% rebate for international students. I mean, so that's really, really a huge rebate if you think about how much you have to pay if you go outright to the UK. So, uh, you know, 20% international fee in the UK is uh, non-trivial and we are happy to offer that. Okay. Again, for more information, you can uh, join the counselling session later, which is also available on this site uh, at southhentermalaysia.com. So, um, is the campus located in a conducive environment and equipped with facilities? Uh, this is an absolute resounding yes. So, our current campus is um, situated in uh, Iskandar Putri, Johor. So, if you just go to any property website and so on, you'd find that Iskandar Putri is uh, consistently ranked to fifth in Malaysia as the uh, prime location to be in. Okay? So, uh, obviously, the first and second will be, always be the uh, common places like uh, Ampang, in Malaysia and all the KLCC region, then uh, Iskandar Putri come next, okay? So uh, usually, again, as I mentioned, it's the third to fifth uh, portion area. So, yep. So uh, just drop over if you haven't been to Iskandar Putri, you'd find that you know, there's a lot of um, you know, great facilities and so on. And also in 2021, um, we as a campus will be expanding to a larger and higher spec campus um, in collaboration with Eco World and it's also located within Iskandar Putri. And then uh, the location offers accommodation choices with uh, different budget options. And of course, our campus is um, fully equipped with laboratories and also student engagement space. So that shouldn't be a uh, concern. And um, okay, this uh, recent graduate list. So we do have uh, graduates over here and they're all uh, real graduates because uh, I've taught every single one of them. Um, I can see at least um, 10 of them uh, were taught by me for two full years and another two of them were taught by me for uh, one year. I recall them very vividly. So um, they are doing very well and very proud that they are in uh, companies like Rolls-Royce, um, GE, General Electric, Ricardo, Dyson, Gamuda, Spirit, Maxis, and you know, a lot more. So um, I guess that's all.